Let me welcome all of you to this really important event and uh, apologize to you for not being with you in person. Um, for those who know me, um, this is not how my voice normally sounds. I'm afraid that I'm suffering from uh, uh, laryngitis and I also have bronchitis. It's gone into my chest and so I wasn't able to travel. And, uh, and it's a source of great regret to me that I'm not with you and able to hear the testimony, able to see and meet so many of you whom I have known over many, many years. Uh, I want to thank the organizers first for making possible this event. And, uh, and I know because some of my colleagues uh, from the law uh, in Britain have sent me photographs of this incredible hall that you're all in. And I'm just sorry that I'm not there uh, in it with you. Um, but the organizers have put together a very important event to deal with a topic which uh, really should be uh, commanding the attention of the world. And that is what is happening to the media um, in our times and the effect of that upon the safety of journalists, the truth tellers in our midst. Um, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for practicing at the English bar now for over uh, 40 years. And I, uh, I have practiced in many of the major cases in Britain, but I now also have uh, a great um, uh, deal of work uh, internationally. Um, I'm the director of the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute. And, uh, and that has really raised for me some of the issues that you'll be talking about today. Um, I'm also a member of the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom. Now you're going to wonder how, what is this high level panel of uh, legal experts on media freedom? It's actually an independent body that was convened in July uh, 2019 at the request of the United Kingdom and Canadian governments who were concerned about uh, the increasing deaths of journalists and uh, the way in which journalism uh, globally was under attack. The high level panel um, is sort of under the umbrella of a wider media project um, uh, of the um, that uh, is uh, uh, convened by the uh, UNESCO and many other countries are now signing up to their commitment and pledge to protect media freedom, um, but we have to translate uh, those pledges into reality. The panel comprises a diverse group of leading lawyers from around the world. Hina Jilani, who ran the Human Rights Commission in Pakistan, Erwin Kotler, who was the Attorney General in Canada, Lord Newberger, who was the President of the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom. Um, but we have lawyers from uh, South Korea, from India, uh, from the Middle East, and so on. Uh, and the purpose is that we should provide advice and recommendations to governments and prevent and reverse abuses of media freedom. It's a tall order. The high-level panel uh, is, uh, is trying to ensure uh, that governments um, uh, really comply with their international ob obligations that already exist on media freedom. Um, but we're also disseminating model legislation uh, to promote and protect a vibrant free press. We're also, um, uh, we've written now a whole set of reports, which I would encourage you to see um, about the ways in which we should be strengthening international law and mechanisms in order uh, to protect this vital part of, uh, of any decent society. And we have to really deal with the incredible uh, targeting of journalists for their work um, and find ways of addressing that seriously. In recent years, freedom of the media and legitimate reporting by journalists has been undermined, undermined by populist leaders, even in supposedly democratic states. We've all seen this. Journalists and media outlets are accused of spreading fake news or other spurious offenses. And many authoritarian leaders across the globe have a history of attacking, and in some cases criminalizing, and even killing journalists because they present an alternative narrative to the one that the uh, leader, the esteemed leader, is promoting. Um, it's the role of journalists, of course, to expose corruption 
and abuse and the ways in which governments are behaving. And they seek to establish accountability. And without accountability, governments become tyrannies. Sadly, some leaders in countries which have hitherto stood up for freedom of expression have made statements which have emboldened these authoritarian leaders to step up their attacks. And we only have to think of uh, President Trump in the United States uh, to think of his influence uh, on uh, and this sort of reduction of standards there and elsewhere. Independent journalism is about truth telling. It's what authoritarian regimes and populist governments are most afraid of, the fear of truth. And it's why media freedom is absolutely vital. The importance of our fight for those who stand on the front lines, courageously exposing corruption and abuse of power and human rights violations is paramount. Truth is at the very core of human rights law. Uh, when freedom of uh, expression is violated, truth is the victim. Truth again moves to the center though, for the rest of us, because it's a state's obligation to conduct their investigations and prosecute alleged perpetrators of crimes. And we as lawyers and jurists have to be the advocates for proper processes and advocates for freedom of expression. At the uh, uh, Institute of Human Rights, of which I'm the director, I remember that when we started the Media Freedom Project, uh, one of our uh, distinguished judges, an internationally known judge, said, why are we um, giving such primacy to media freedom, Helena? And my response was that without media freedom, there is no justice. There is no decent law. There is no protection of the rule of law. With the rise of populist governments, regime takeovers, and the COVID-19 pandemic, there are many reasons to fear for the future of media freedom. During the pandemic, where access to information was crucial for, for citizens to know how they could protect themselves and their families. Targeted attacks against journalists reached a record high. In 2020, at least 2,074 journalists have been imprisoned and at least 66 journalists have been killed globally. And those are the ones we know about. We've heard mention of Daphne uh, Caruana Galizia, whose son Matthew is with us today. A brave and courageous woman who was brutally murdered. Jamal Khashoggi, whose uh, fiance, Hatice uh, Chengiz, is also with us today. Um, I had the, uh, the, the disturbing experience of being part of the team that went with um, that uh, uh, brave um, uh, uh, rapporteur um, uh, um, who went to investigate in Turkey uh, the death of Jamal Khashoggi, the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi, and heard the evidence myself of his being killed. And you can't hear that sort of thing and have that sort of experience without it affecting how you conduct yourself as a lawyer thereafter. Agnes Calamar's report should have shaken the world, and yet it was business as usual. Many years ago, I gave a, a, an award to Anna Politkovskaya. I've got to get her name right, Anna Politkovskaya. And Anna came to Britain to get that award from Penn uh, for her brave journalism. And she described how she had been at one stage poisoned. And when she was taking a flight, she was going to investigate crimes committed by the state. And uh, that evening, I sat with her after dinner talking and over wine, uh, we discussed her safety. And I was fearful for her. And I, I urged her not to return to Russia. And uh, she said that she had to, she heard it was where her family was, where her son was, and it was where her commitment was. And only a few weeks later, I opened my newspaper to see uh, the bloodied staircase where she had been uh, assassinated. Those experiences, teach you why, why our voices are so important. 
We're seeing global trends in how state and non-state actors suppress media freedoms and identify their prime targets, who are the media professionals. In efforts to justify their behaviour, states arrest, prosecute and imprison journalists. More countries are adopting vague and expansive counterterrorism and uh, cyber security legislation, which is really there to silence those exposing their actions in the name of national security. It's becoming increasingly clear that in moments of political turmoil, media workers are often the first targets. And then, of course, there's a sort of trajectory. They go after dissenters, those who speak truth to power, those who are letting the people know what is going on. And then they go after uh, the uh, lawyers and the judges who act for them and who seek to bring justice and to shed light on uh, state activities too. Um, human rights defenders are always, and that's all of us, uh, all of us who believe in human rights and believe in their protection, um, all of us end up becoming uh, at risk. But we have to give primary consideration to those who are in the front line, who are the journalists. We've seen recently in Sudan, which is facing a military takeover, um, concerning reports of the military raiding media outlets, cutting access to inter the internet and military uh, telecommunications. Um, of the previous uh, order, arresting a state television manager and journalists assaulted by pro-military pro protesters. It's not new, all of this stuff. And of course, um, during the, the pandemic, we've seen in Kashmir, frequent uh, closing down of the internet in places like Kashmir with the Modi government uh, uh, having that power in its hands. Many female journalists reporting intersecting forms of violence through physical attacks, sexual violence, online harassment, verbal threats of rape, of being killed in the most horrifying and terrible language, um, and of course, discrimination. In 2020, there were at least, well, there were thousands, I suspect, threats, but reported, certainly the ones that we know of, um, uh, were highly increased threats against female journalists um, in comparison to even the year before 2019. The majority of these attacks, including physical attacks and impediments to their work, continue. Since the Taliban's takeover in Afghanistan, female journalists have had to flee. They've been forced out of their jobs. They've been threatened for their lives. They're in mortal danger. Out of Kabul's 700 female journalists, over 600 have stopped working, and those who remain are fearful uh, for their existence. Chilled into uh, uh, journalism, it can't really be called that. In efforts to control the spread of information, the Taliban have imposed a vaguely written set of 11 rules, such as the prohibition on insulting national figures. You always know there's a problem when there's an, a, a prohibition on criticizing the, those who rule. Um, but they also have brought law in, which is about distorting news content. Who decides who distorts? Um, in the post-Soviet region, there were 4,611 attacks on media professionals in 2020. I'm talking about across what was formerly the Soviet nations, uh, the Soviet regions, and which are now independent nations. But it's uh, 2.5 times higher than it was in 2019. So we're in incrementally seeing increases in attacks, and they're including physical attacks and threats to life, to freedom and health, and sometimes they're non-physical, uh, non but um, emotionally the damage is terrible into the mental health of those who suffer them. And of course, there are cyber attacks, threats um, to legal prosecutions of legal prosecutions and economic attacks. In 2020, in the aftermath of the disputed presidential elections um, in, uh, uh, in Russia, um, there were almost 2,000 attacks and threats against professional and civilian media workers um, reported. 96% of the attacks were committed by government officials. And then we've had the business in Tunisia where um, President Say's power grab in July 2021 um, meant that the Al Jazeera offices in Tunis were forcibly raided, closed down by heavily armed pol uh, police officers with no warrant, removed staff, 
barred them from re-entry and had access to the computers and uh, vital information that journalists had stored. Many civilian journalists are being referred to military tribunals in a dangerous move to uh, suppress public dissent, is the claim. Now, then you only have to think about the Philippines and my wonderful friend, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Maria Ressa, who you will he hear from later. The persecution of the media has been accompanied by online harassment campaigns or orchestrated by pro-Duterte troll armies. And they've launched cyber attacks um, and they've really gone after alternative news websites and the site of the National Union of Journalists there in F the Philippines to block them all. Um, and Maria Reza, who has been so courageous in, uh, in uh, her, uh, basically in her, uh, journalism, her wonderful, powerful journalism, exposing corruption. And yet uh, she has uh, faced such incredible uh, repeated prosecutions and threats. In 2012, she co-founded Rappler, and you'll hear about it later. And uh, But what she's exposing, of course, now is how social media has been used by governments, to, and by particularly her own government, to spread fake news um, or dishonesty, let's not use the words fake news, but dishonesty. And, uh, and she's showing how um, they are harassing opponents of uh, the government and manipulating public discourse. Um, so often social media has become a megaphone uh, for the tyrant. Looking at uh, the severe, severest end of the spectrum, perhaps one third of journalist killings in uh, 2020 took place in Mexico, one of the deadliest countries in the world for journalists. 137 Mexican journalists murdered for their work since 2000, uh, including 17 killed since um, President Obrador took office. So no great improvement. In the midst of these chilling trends and statistics, impunity reigns. In eight out of 10 cases, killers uh, are immune from any punishment at all. Now this tribunal, of course, is, is doing vital work and it's going to focus on the murder of journalists. Um, and I just wanted to say that looking at this, taking this evidence is going to be so important to the end, the, the work that we must do in the hereafter. The role of people's tribunals in investigating serious crimes, as, as you have already been told, has grown uh, within the international arena. And it started, of course, with a powerful intervention in 1966 um, with uh, a war crimes tribunal um, about Vietnam. Um, and it's basically about preventing the crime of silence. The crime of silence. And, uh, and so that's what this tribunal will seek to do too, to basically rid us of the silence that has surrounded the killing and the persecution of so many journalists. And, uh, and we really have to remember the imbalances of accountability that exist around our world. There have been people's tribunals in many places in Colombia, uh, in uh, Turkey, around the issues of the, of the Kurdish community and how it's been treated. Um, in relation to the international crimes that were committed against the Rohingya, Kachin and other groups. I've recently assisted in the creation of a People's Tribunal looking into the crimes committed by the People's Republic of China um, against the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs and other Turkish Muslims in the Uyghur region of Northwest China. This this form of grassroots justice is a global response by civil society, by international lawyers, by judges, experts and civilians to circumvent the lack of political will among states. And that is why we're gathering here today. This People's Tribunal on the Murder of Journalists aims to continue preventing the crime of silence. And it's the coalition of renowned press me media uh, organizations, press freedom organizations, Free Press Unlimited, the Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters, um, journalists, uh, journalists and Reporters Without Borders, in cooperation uh, with the Syrian Center for Media Freedom, 
um, um, of Expression and the Centre for Justice and Accountability. All those organisations, and many of you are here from other organisations too, um, have joined in creating this event. The prosecution, of course, has been formed by a team of leading international lawyers from Guernica 37, the International Law Chambers. And um, it will indict um, the, the, uh, the many governments who have failed. The Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, the Syrian Arab Republic and the state of Mexico in relation to their conduct in the cases of the journalists La Santa Wikri Matungi, Nabil Al-Shara Abadji, Miguel and Angel Velasco. And so I just wanted to finally say to you that those three cases are emblematic of the persistent impunity for the murders of journalists across the world. And you'll hear about the horrifying events that were faced by those journalists, by Miguel Nabil and, uh, and uh, our Sri Lankan colleague. Uh, these three cases are emblematic, as I say, of what is happening where the state fails to protect the lives of journalists by thoroughly investigating legitimate threats and killings. Um, and, and with regard to prevalent and varied attacks against journalists with impunity. Um, you will also uh, hear, I think, virtually from Nadim Huri, who sits alongside me on this high-level panel that I spoke to you about of legal experts. And Nadim will speak to the principal findings of a report that was produced by the high-level high panel, advised on promoting more effective investigations into abuses against journalists. That report was released in November of last year. And I urge you to read it. The report concludes with three major recommendations to the signatories of the Global Pledge, those 40 countries that I told you about, who pledged to protect media freedom. But it's also for other governments to strengthen investigations into attacks on journalists, to address the issue of impunity and progress towards accountability. Um, and we really have to think about the creation of a standing international investigative task force. A standing investigative task force. Because without that, you will not have that nimble and quick response to the killings of journalists. And it would not fall to rapporteurs like Agnes Calamar to be brave. She would have at her disposal an investigative team already in existence who could work with her or other rapporteurs in, uh, in providing proper and serious investigation with the skills that are, are necessary. Now, I just to conclude want to say that despite the appalling state of media freedom uh, globally, there is room for hope. When civil society and international lawyers and experts and journalists and media workers gather as we are here today, we can pave the way for truth telling and the holding of perpetrators accountable. And we've got to listen carefully to the witnesses' testimony. And, uh, and you'll hear from really powerful voices today to reflect on the threats to journalists and the impact of freedom of on freedom of expression, the obstacles that there are to justice and the persistent and horrifying impunity that exists. And this glo global trend has to be challenged because it's leading to such egregious crime the crime of murder. And so I just want to say, we have to, as lawyers and all the organizations represented here today and jurists around the world, we have to amplify, amplify the voices of journalists and we have to be their protectors. Um, global civil society has to call for media freedom and we have to call for justice because without peace and justice, our world is in a parlous place. And so the pursuit of justice for journalists and for those who protect journalists is a really paramount uh, role for all of us. And I hope that today's hearings uh, lead to that sense of urgency that is required to stop the murders which have increased in recent years. Thank you very much. I regret that I'm not with you. My voice is about to give out completely. But thank you.